Uh, together we're going through the Gospel of Mark in a series we're call, calling Focusing on Christ. A fresh look at Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel is familiar to many of us, uh, maybe not all of us, but many of us. And uh, some of us probably have read it several times. I'm just hoping through this series we see it with fresh eyes. Maybe there's things you've forgotten, things you haven't seen before. And we're really hoping that um, this series might uh, awaken you to uh, Mark's presentation of who Jesus is. It's a wonderful biography. And this passage this evening where Jesus meets a leper, or a leper meets Jesus in chapter 1, to me is one of the most astonishing passages in the Gospel of Mark. I really like it. It's an amazing story. It's so jam-packed full of uh, wonderful imagery as it uh, not only illustrates Jesus' beauty and his compassion and so on, but it actually illustrates what Christianity is all about. This passage is a beautiful paragraph loaded with what Jesus and his mission is all about. It is a wonderful story. And it was a wonderful story to the first Christians as well. This story makes it into three of the four biographies on Jesus. It seems that they wanted to include this story because this story illustrates much of what Jesus, Christianity, is all about. Uh, let me just first give you a little bit of background. Um, and you could really take this background and apply it to any component, any passage in Mark's Gospel. <coughs> and I wanted to make sure that we all understand kind of uh, Mark's purpose. We live in a, in a world that is broken. All of us live in this world that is damaged. It's hemorrhaging in all sorts of ways. Poverty, terrorism, the sex trade. Um, war in the Middle East, the threat of nuclear war in the Far East, um, greed rampant in some parts of our culture. Um, we live in a broken world and uh, we're probably feeling it quite acutely at the moment when terrorism is on our doorstep in a big way over the last month or so. But all of these things that we're witnessing now really have been repeating themselves over since the dawn of time really war and famine and greed fighting battles uh, people being treated badly racism uh, the sex trade all sorts of things have been going on since the dawn of time and humanity has been crying out if there is a god why doesn't he intervene why doesn't he step into this world and do something the Old Testament, again and again, through her prophets, Israel's prophets, said again and again that God will intervene, that one day he will vindicate his people. There will be a, a new era of justice and of hope and of life and of joy and of peace. There will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more dying, no more sadness there'll be no more death even there'll be a new jerusalem a new city a new people place where people god's people can dwell this era of bad things happening of terrible things happening will come to an end the prophets prophesied about it again and again and they said that this new era this new reign god's kingdom will come into this world bringing peace and justice and so on through one person, a Messiah, a King, a Christ, an anointed ruler of God who will be both a Saviour and a ruler. A Saviour King will come. Christians came on in the first century and said that this one who was prophesied about, that we read about in books like Isaiah, who says he was wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting uh, Father, Prince of Peace. Christians came on the scene in the first century and said, this man, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, is this Messiah who has come 
into the world, to usher in this new era, to bring peace, to bring harmony between man and God, and to bring in justice and all sorts of things. And of course, many people were puzzled by the Christian's claim. They would say, how could Jesus of Nazareth be the Christ? Because in the Old Testament, we read about uh, a man who would rise up and conquer enemies and vindicate God's people and rebuild this Jerusalem. And Jerusalem wasn't being rebuilt. And the Romans were ruling over God's people, so to speak, in the first century. And there was still poverty and injustice and... And how on earth could a carpenter's son bring about all of this? But the New Testament writers, the first Christians, are all saying, no, Jesus is the Messiah. He's just a king, not in the way everyone thinks. And the kingdom that he's bringing in, the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies are coming in through his ministry, but just not in the way that most people, in fact, just about everyone, expected. And the New Testament is largely a big argument, defense of who Jesus is and what his mission is all about and how you're you're to live in, in this kingdom. The New Testament authors say that Jesus has inaugurated the kingdom. It's begun. We've got a glimpse of it. And we have some of the benefits now, if you want in. But it just hasn't come fully at the end of time. It hasn't consummated. It's inaugurated, it's begun, it's began to poke its head through into this world and has been going on for the last two year, 2,000 years. But it isn't fully consummated yet. We won't see it. It's like an Olympic swimmer who has touched the end of the pool and won gold. The victory's been won, but the parade, the great victory parade, which happens when the Olympian comes back into the country and there's a big parade in Trafalgar Square or down Oxford Street or somewhere. That's still yet to come. What Jesus has done in his ministry is he started, he's given us a glimpse of what is to come. And it's begun to poke its head into this world. And we can have friendship with God, we can be reconciled to him, but we don't see him face to face yet. We have forgiveness now if you want it. God is willing to wipe the slate clean. But we still aren't in heaven yet. So we still have sadness, we still experience illness and death. But one day there'll be a resurrection. One day there'll be uh, no more tears, no more crying. And we will have complete peace. That's what the New Testament is, is saying. And this passage so beautifully explains some of this to us. It's, what, it's why this miracle was so important to first century Christians. Let me point out four things in the passage. The first thing is is that Mark, who wrote this version of the story, is trying to get us to see that Jesus really is the Saviour King or the Saviour Christ or Messiah. He is the rescuer ruler. And we see it in the opening verse of the story. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you're willing, you can make me clean. This leper who comes to him sees in Jesus both a saviour and a king, someone who can rescue him, but someone that he needs to bend the knee to, someone who has great power, who can rule over disease and make it come out of him. Uh, A leper would have been in extreme need in the first century. I'm sure many of you know this, but a leper, particularly in Jewish society, first century, was really ostracized. They couldn't hold down a job, they couldn't work in the community, they weren't even allowed in the town or the village. They certainly weren't allowed to participate in the community life of um, uh, their religion. So they couldn't go into the synagogue, they couldn't go into the temple at all. There's no way they could do that because they were considered unclean and it was considered infectious. Now, leprosy, by the way, covers a whole lot of different skin diseases in the ancient world. But let's, for argument's sake, this man has full-blown leprosy, as we probably know of it at least. Hansen's disease, I think, is the correct term. 
Here is a man that would have been forced to live outside of the town. If he was married, he could no longer be with his wife. If he was a father, he could no longer be with his children. He couldn't be uh, amongst other work colleagues. If he was walking through the town, he would have to yell out from the top of his voice, unclean, unclean, as he walked along a road. By Levitical Jewish law, he would have to do that. And you can imagine mothers grabbing their little children. Oh, don't go near the leper, he's the unclean one. And because he had to do this, everyone in town would have known him. Probably had to beg at the city gates to get food, to get money. Live out in the tombs, live out in open graves or things, things like that, in caves. Because he wasn't allowed in town. Pharisees particularly ostracised unclean lepers because they believed that their leprosy was a result of (coughs) sin well many of them did anyway and we're told that uh, Pharisees wouldn't come within 10 feet of a leper and on a windy day within a hundred feet of a leper and if a leper was walking past and the shadow of that leper came by them they would go home and wash their clothes If a leper became even in the vicinity of where they were eating, any bowl that was open, just left on a shelf, left in their hand, that was open, they would go home and wash it, just because they'd been in the vicinity of a leper. This man was in need. I would say his relationship with God would have been strained, because he couldn't go into the synagogue, he couldn't go into uh, the temple in Jerusalem. I would say that his uh, relationship with other people was broken as well. He couldn't be with his family, he couldn't be with friends, he couldn't be with his work colleagues. His body was certainly broken and his actually whole world was broken. He had to live outside in tombs outside of the city. This man is in a state and yet he breaks the norm of the day, the rules of the day, and he comes to Jesus and he sees in Jesus a saviour, <coughs> king. First of all, king. He came to him and begged him on his knees. There's something about Jesus that he sees that he's not worthy. He, can, he, he rules. He would have heard about it. We know earlier from Mark that this man would have probably heard about the miracles that were going on in the region of Galilee. And so he knows that Jesus rules over disease, sickness, illness, and so on. So he comes and he begs him on his knees and says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. If you're simply willing, you can do this. He can see in Jesus a ruler, but he also sees in Jesus a savior. You can make me clean. That's very interesting. You can make me, he doesn't say you can make me well, you can heal me. He says you can make me clean, meaning that clean, cleanliness means I can go back into the community. I can go and get a job again, I can be with my family, I can be with my friends, I can go back into town again. You can, not just make my body better, you can make all four things better. My relationship with God, my relationship with others, my body, and my whole system living the whole way I live, my whole world. You can make me clean so I can, I can be completely repaired. So he sees in Jesus a saviour king. Secondly, we see in this Jesus as the compassionate and indignant one. Jesus as the compassionate and indignant one. And this is in verse 41. Jesus was moved with compassion. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. He got a lot in this. Jesus moved with compassion. Now you notice here, there's a little footnote that you'll see in your Bibles as well as on the screen. And that is some old manuscripts, some of our most ancient manuscripts of the New Testament have either Jesus was moved with compassion or Jesus was indignant or angry or upset. Um, That means it's what we call in technical terms a textual variant. 
Occasionally the New Testament, Old Testament has these. And there's a number of reasons for it. I won't go into it, but there's, you can ask me afterwards. But it's just occasionally there's one word where it's different in some manuscripts compared to others. Now when you're translating the Bible and you have all the manuscripts to your fingertips, which <coughs> translation do you go for? Do you translate it from these manuscripts which says he's filled with compassion or he's filled with uh, anger, he's indignant? Which, which is it? Well I kind of want to go with both. Play my cards uh, safely if you like. Uh, I want to go with both. Um, it could be either, and I'm comfortable with either. Uh, that is because I think both are godly. I don't think Jesus is angry with the man. He's angry, he's upset, he's indignant about just what has happened to the man. And he also has compassion on him. He's deeply moved by the situation. I have, and I'm sure you have those feelings, both those dual feelings, when you think about the war in Syria or starvation at the moment in uh, East Africa, in countries like Nigeria and Yemen and Somalia. Those countries are facing enormous... One writer this week said, this is probably the greatest humanitarian crisis since World War II, certainly in that area. I feel compassion for those people, but I also feel angry. I'm indignant about the situation. And that's what Jesus is here. So I could go either with him being full of compassion or fill, filled with anger. He's indignant here. Jesus was moved by this man. I've said this many times at the boathouse, and I love this quote. Bill Hybels once said, No one has ever locked eyes with someone that didn't matter to God. No one has ever locked eyes with someone that didn't matter to God. And Jesus sees this fella, and he, he matters to him. You know, in the ancient world, and in some cultures even uh, up until the last century, if someone contracted leprosy, full-blown leprosy, some cultures would hold a funeral for that person even though they hadn't died yet. They were as good as dead. They were walking dead. This man mattered to God. Jesus didn't see him as a dead man. He had compassion on him. He's angry about the situation that he's in. And so he reached out and he touched the man. Jesus doesn't always do that. When blind people come to him, he doesn't always heal, heal them that way. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. When a, when a deaf person comes to him, with Lazarus being risen from the grave, he doesn't touch him. He just says, Lazarus, come forth. He doesn't always touch the person, but he touches this man. And I suspect there's a good reason why. I suspect that this man probably hadn't been touched by anyone. In a long time. Paul Brand was a physician working in India with lepers, a famous doctor, and he did a lot of work for lepers in that country. And one day he was working in his surgery and he had a man who had leprosy in his surgery who was clearly uh, very upset. And as Paul Brand was talking to him via a translator, this man began to weep uncontrollably. And this female translator was looking at Paul Brand, and Paul Brand's looking at the female translator, and Paul Brand's saying, are you translating this right? Because what I'm saying is good news for this young man, and I'm hoping that it's, he, he, he knows it. Are you, are you saying what I'm saying? Because he shouldn't be crying. And this female translator looked back and said, Doctor, this man isn't crying because of what you're saying to him. He's crying because as you're speaking to him, you have your hand on his shoulder and no one's touched him in about seven years. <clears throat> what would it be like to not have a human touch, a handshake, a pat on the back, not being able to play sport, not being able to run around with your friends, not to feel the love, the embrace of a loved one? whether it's your family or a partner. 
Jesus in front of everyone was breaking the code of staying away. He reached out and touched the man. And here we see again the compassion of Jesus. I'm willing. I'm willing to heal you. I'm willing. I am so willing to do this. I want to do this. So we see the compassion of Jesus here. Thirdly, we see Jesus as the cleaner and restorer. Jesus is the cleaner and restorer. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. It's amazing, as he reached out and touched him, I bet you everyone was thinking the leper was going to infect Jesus. But actually it's the other way around. Jesus infects the leper. Be clean and Jesus cleanses him. He is made clean, he is made whole, he is made pure again. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone. You think, did I read that right? Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. You'd say, you'd think Jesus would go, uh, well Mark would say, Jesus sent him away with a strong encouragement. Go and tell everyone, announce it, preach the good news about me, tell everyone what I have done. He doesn't, he says, keep quiet about it. Why? Well, this is very early on, it seems, in Jesus' ministry, near the beginning. It's in chapter 1 of Mark's Gospel. It's in the earlier chapters of Matthew and Luke. This is early on in his ministry. He hasn't come just to heal people physically. He's come to heal people spiritually as well as physically, to make us completely whole, to reconcile us to God. So if he goes around Galilee just becoming this sort of circus show, this miracle man who's just healing people, it's going to hinder his ministry because he has got something greater to do than heal one or two or ten or a hundred people. He's come to heal the world. And he's going to do that by laying down his life for you and me. He's come to die for you and me. And that is his great mission, not just to heal people in Galilee from their physical ailments. So at this stage, he says, don't tell everyone. Later on, of course, once he dies and is resurrected, he says to his followers, now go, go tell the world, go and make disciples, spread it around the world. Then is we to take it internationally. But at this stage, just keep quiet. I'm on a mission. I'm here to save and to rescue. And that's what's happening here. He's cleansed. And then he says, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Go and show yourself to the priests. They will verify, they will give you a full bill of, he uh, bill of health and they'll allow you to go back into work. They'll allow you to go back and live in the community and they'll allow you to go back into the synagogue in your town and go to the temple in Jerusalem and worship and sacrifice there. Jesus isn't just healing the man, he's helping him, instructing him to be completely healed, completely made whole, to go back. Show yourself that you've been healed as a testimony to them. Show them that you're clean and they'll look at your skin and they'll determine you've been completely healed and you'll be allowed back in to society. That's what Jesus is doing. He's healing this man. He's the cleanser. He's the cleaner. He's come to make, not just heal him from leprosy, but come to make him whole and clean and get him back into society. And last of all, we see Jesus as the servant and substitute. Now I love this uh, point. This, this, this means so much to me as a, as a preacher. We are all like this man. All of us 
are like him. We're all unclean before God. We've all wronged God. We've all rebelled against him. We're all unclean, dirty, filthy. We're not pure before him. We have impure thoughts. We say impure things. We do impure things. We're all like this man. I love to tell the story. Many of you have heard me tell this story before, but I hope you'll bear with me. Malcolm Muggridge, BBC journalist, was living in India uh, when he was alive, at some stage of his life, with his wife Kitty. And before he did his journalism in the day, uh, his writing, he would go down to a nearby river, very much like this, and swim up and down the river for some early morning exercise. And each day he would go down and take off his robe and just before he got in the water he'd look across the other side of the river. It's very easy for me to picture this looking this way. He would see a woman on the other side of the river also disrobing, completely naked and having a bath. And he figured this woman was so bold and so comfortable with her nakedness and that was the part of the village that was the more kind of questionable end of town. But Malcolm Muggridge even though he was married, thought that woman's a prostitute and he began to lust after her and think about swimming across to proposition her. But he resisted for some time and he'd swim up and down and see her on the other side of the river each, each morning. But then one day he went down and his lust got the better of him. He disrobed and instead of swimming up and down the river, he swam across trying to outpace his conscience and swim after the last of the whole thing. And then he got to the other side and then stood up in a few feet of water, still heavy breathing because he was swimming so fast. As he stood up, he stood within two feet of the woman and realised to his absolute shock and horror, she was a leper. And apparently two things struck him, struck him. Number one was what a rotten, awful, leprous body she had. And number two, what an awful, rotten, leprous heart he had. It sobered him up. I mean, when you really look in the mirror, do you see it? You see the, the ugly person inside the evilness. You, I'm sure you all do good things, you're all lovely people, but deep down we can do bad things, selfish things, prideful things. We act out of jealousy, we sometimes get anger when, angry uh, unrighteously when we shouldn't. We do all sorts of things, we're full of materialism, self-centeredness. We're all like this man. But if we come to him and beg him on his Beg, beg him on our knees and say, look, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus is saying, yes, I am willing. I am so willing. I'm willing to go to the cross and die for you so that you can be clean, so it can be made possible, so that you can be made pure and clean. I am so willing that Jesus, within three years of this moment, goes to Calvary and dies for this man and for all of humanity. This fourth point was saying Jesus is the great substitute swapper. That's because in this story, we've actually got it here in the text. Jesus swapping places with the leper. Right down the end, we read these words. <clears throat> Instead, the man went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in the lonely places. Jesus and the leper swapped places. So the leper would have had to live outside in the lonely places, outside of the city, not able to go in. But now, as a result of this healing and this man's disobedience, it's Jesus is the one who has to live outside in the lonely places, in the desolate places, and can't go in, and his life is interrupted. His world is 
shattered in some respects. The leper and Jesus swap places. When I was growing up in Sydney, Australia, and a lovely mum from down the road came to my school and taught me the Christian faith for the first time, it was this message that she taught me of the God who sees me as dirty and unclean, and I believe that. I knew that deep down. But a God who loves me all the same, who has compassion on me, a God who wants to heal me, who wants to rescue me. And as I began to listen to this lady week by week, and same with my friends, we slowly became more acquainted with Jesus, and I recognised him as my Lord and my Saviour, my Saviour King. And when I was about 14, 15 years old, somewhere around there, I, I remember getting on my knees and asking God, please, Lord, if you're willing, you can save me, you can rescue me, you can make me clean, you can reconcile me. And I did that. I got down on my knees and I, I prayed that prayer and said, can you make me clean? And it wasn't instantaneous, but over the next nine months or so as my guest now, I came to a realisation that Jesus is so willing that 2,000 years ago he swapped places with me. And he became the leprous one, the unclean one, the dirty one in God's eyes. And I was made clean because of my faith and my trust in him. And he was punished and he went to the desolate place. He was cast out in a sense and I was welcomed back in because of him swapping places with me. That blew my mind. Now I know many of you know this and many of you made a commitment exactly the same as I have or in a similar way. But I wonder if there's one or two of us that haven't done that yet. I wonder if you would consider maybe now or this evening coming back to him saying, Lord, I am unclean. I've been unclean. Please forgive me. Change me. And thank you for swapping places with me. Let's pray.